Hi, welcome to the last lecture of week two. Carlos has taken you through some of the metrics that you may encounter in practice. And we noticed how many of them are focused on controls and, to a lesser extent, on vulnerabilities. In other words, there seems to be a bias towards the left side of the framework. This bias is partially because these types of metrics are easier to measure, but it also reflects the incentives of the entities that develop them and use them. Controls can be sold, they can be managed, and they keep the liability of security failures with the buyer. So what is the effect of this bias? Well, one important effect is that putting all kinds of contro controls in place might create a false sense of security. We tend to think that the control is guaranteed to produce a certain amount of security. At the very minimum, we expect that it con contributes positively to the security level. Take controls like standards, certifications, and auditing. In principle, these are good ideas. But we don't actually understand very well how they perform in practice, in all the different contexts in which they are deployed. We assume they correlate with the security level, but we often don't know. Sure, we have reasons to assume, but there are also reasons why these assumptions might be wrong. And we tend to ignore the evidence of the latter. Let me give you a short example. Apple's App Store contains a lot more auditing and checks than an alternative App Store like Cydia. The latter you can only use if you jailbreak, if you basically hack your Apple device. In alternative App Stores, there's a lot less supervision than in the official App Store. Anyone can upload, share, and sell apps. In terms of controls, most people would predict that the Apple App Store is more secure and protects users better. Well, turns out that prediction is wrong. A few years ago, some American researchers tested a large sample of apps from both app stores. And they found that the apps in the official app store leak more private data than those in the alternative app store. How is this possible? Fewer controls and yet more privacy? One explanation may be that Apple, as the operator of the platform, has an incentive to allow more private user data to be shared with app developers. And that incentive is called advertising. If you're interested in more details about this study, you can find the link on our site. Now, what does this example tell us? Well, it tells us that you cannot trust controls to always do what you think they do. You need to study their actual effects. You need to understand how they interact with the threat environment, with the real world. There is another reason why this is important. There are many more potential threats than you can ever defense against. Threats are events that might happen after all, and many of these never materialize. So it's not very productive to sink a lot of your resources into defending against all of them. Plus, some threats will emerge that you did not anticipate. This is where incident metrics come in. Incidents give you crucial feedback about how your controls are performing and where you might want to allocate your resources. So what are the properties of incident metrics? To explore this question, I'm going to use an extended example from our own research, defending against botnets. Most of you will be familiar with the term botnets. They are the networks of machines that are infected with malware. They're under the control of criminals who use them for spam, account takeover, denial of service attacks, click fraud, ransomware, and more. It's a hard problem that governments, industry, and consumers have been grappling with for years now. How can we use incident data to improve the security against botnets? You could answer this question for your own organization, but also for a whole market or country, or even globally, as we are doing. Let's say that we see each infection as an incident. It's a security failure after all. Well, there are many data sources that collect data on infected machines. Sinkholes, spam traps, dark nets, and more. We don't need to discuss the ins and outs of these data sources. The main thing you need to understand is that they all see a slice of the total population of infected machines, either in your organization or worldwide. And this slice is different for each source and has its own typical biases. Now, how can you extract a meaningful security metric from this data? We're going to explore this with real data from the sinkhole of the Configure botnet. 
a sync all server is what is put in place when defenders manage to take over the command and control of a botnet. The infected machines then contact the sync all server, thinking it's the command and control server of the criminals, because they are looking for commands from their criminal masters. So the sinkhole sees even, or it sees many, or even all of the machines that are part of that specific botnet. What metric could you extract from this data? Well, if each infection is an incident, as we said before, you could simply count the infections. And that would give you an incident rate. Let's say the number of infected machines you see every day. You could then track this incident rate over time to see whether your security is improving. If you would use data this way, you would see something like this. This is real data. On the vertical axis, you see the number of infected machines that show up in the sinkhole every day. The horizontal axis is time. And over time, you see a clear downward trend. So, was your mitigation policy effective? It's unclear. The downward trend could also be caused by attacker behavior. And indeed, that's what happened here. The criminals abandoned the botnet so it is slowly dying off. Now, we can see that the downward trend is likely caused by the attacker behavior if you look at the metric over multiple organizations or multiple countries. In this picture, you see that multiple countries are moving together. That points to a common cause rather than to the effects of specific countermeasures. And here we see a key problem with incident data. It is also driven by the attacker behavior. This is why it is a stochastic metric rather than a deterministic one. So how could you control for attacker behavior? One way to do this is to rank the networks. Rather than looking at the absolute number of incidents as the metric, because that is mostly driven by the attacker, you turn the metric into a rank order that expresses how well or poorly each network does. In a rank metric, Japan, the second line from the top, would consistently be the number two most infected over the whole period, while US, the top line, would be number one. And the fluctuations of the exact number of incidents has then been taken out of the metric. So the rank metric would tell you that some countries have more infections than others. Does that mean their security is worse? Not really. There are many other factors that might drive up their incident rate. Factors that have nothing to do with security. An obvious one is the number of users in the network. Indeed, if we plot the number of infected machines in each country, the vertical axis, against the number of users in that country, the horizontal axis, you see a clear linear relationship. In other words, the more internet users in the country, the more infections. That doesn't mean its security policies are worse. If you know that a certain factor drives the incident rate, you can try to control for it. You could, for example, divide the number of infections by the number of users. Could you then see which networks are performing better? Yes, to some extent. You know, and that's great, but this is just one data source. One limited slice of the problem with its own biases, remember? You could try to overcome this bias by including multiple data sources on infections. Each would result in a different metric. And that's a good step forward, but it also introduces the question of how to then aggregate these metrics into an overall metric. Aggregation is an issue for any situation where you have multiple metrics, which in practice is almost always the case. In fact, if you think about our framework for metrics, controls, vulnerabilities, incidents, you not only have to aggregate somehow the metrics of one type, but actually of multiple types. There are methods for doing this. We can discuss them here in detail. You can think of adding up different rank metrics with a technique called board account, for example, which basically adds up the rank numbers. A more advanced method is to perform factor analysis, where you condense the metrics by statistically analyzing which one, two, or three factors can account for most of the variance in the whole set of metrics. This brings us to the conclusion. What can we learn from this extended example? Well, incident data is very valuable, but it's also very difficult to interpret. It's driven by many factors, and it's hard to isolate the security level from those factors.
to isolate the signal from the noise, so to speak. It requires you to control for attacker behavior and for differences unrelated to security. This is hard enough, and we haven't even talked about all of the standard problems of collecting and analyzing empirical data. Don't get discouraged, though. It's often worth doing, if only because incident metrics add a unique perspective on the security level that you're trying to manage. It's also important, however, to understand the limitations. Incident metrics are, by definition, based on past events. They express what has already happened. They do not necessarily tell you about what is to come. And this is why we also need the other types of metrics in the framework, those for controls and vulnerabilities. A combination of different metrics is the most powerful way to gouge security. To return one last time to our extended example, to understand the effectiveness of botnet mitigation, you could complement the incident metrics with metrics on the level of software patching across the network uh, vulnerabilities and with metrics on network hygiene, that is, whether the appropriate configurations and controls are in place. In fact, a recent study found that these hygiene metrics are strong predictors of the actual infection rates. We will put the link on the course site if you're more interested in this. That's it. Thank you for listening.